right, welcome everybody um, to our teaching and learning call for March 2nd, 2022. And um, today we're going to have a hacks demo from Brian Allendike. Very exciting. Um, but first, we're going to just have a few quick announcements and then I will turn it over to Brian. So, um, just a reminder we are having Sakai days in March. That's going to be Monday and Tuesday, March 21st and 22nd. Um, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. both days. That's Eastern time. So um, it, we've got kind of four time blocks that we'll be using. And uh, there's a, an agenda with um, topics being collected. I'll paste that into the, the Etherpad. Um, I forgot to put the link in there. Um, but uh, you can add additional topics to the agenda if there's something that you would like us to um, to talk about uh, during those times and we'll be kind of designating different um, topics for different times so people kind of know when to drop in if they're interested in something in particular. So um, more to come on the uh, more finalized agenda, but for, for right now you can continue adding any topics that you'd like to see on there. Um, also, we uh, recently released RC01 for Sakai 22 as our first release candidate and a big milestone toward the um, general availability. So um, usually we have about three release candidates. That's the typical average. Um, so what we're planning on there being at least three, but usually they're not terribly far apart. So we're still hoping that um, we can get that uh, out maybe sometime by the end of this month. So um, look for more news on that. If you want to help speed things along, we can always use more QA testing. So if you're interested in helping speed up the release, if you have any cycles to spare for testing, that would be awesome. Um, so we do have a weekly test fest, and you can check the, the calendar um, for those. Um, another announcement, uh, breaking news. We just kind of set the dates yesterday. So we're having SakaiCon this summer. It's going to be July 18th and 19th, and it's going to be online plus Ann Arbor. So it's sort of a hybrid. Um, Dr. Chuck is going to reserve some rooms at University of Michigan for those dates, um, but the bulk of the content will be online for people that aren't able to travel because um, we're not quite sure what the travel climate will be in the summer. So we want to kind of hedge our bets a little bit. Um, there will be more information on that coming soon. But uh, if you want to go ahead and mark your calendars so you have those dates kind of set aside, that would be awesome. Um, so let's see, those are all of my announcements. Does anybody else on the call have any announcements? Is that the week of Open Aperio, Wilma? No, no. Uh, Open Aperio is in June. Oh, right. We actually moved it from June to July because it was a little too close to Open Aperio, and ELI is also in June. And um, we thought that might be a little, a little too much if people were trying to get to all three things. Um, so we moved to the KaiCon to July. Okay, thanks. I, I know Dr. Chuck was talking about a possible meetup at Marist for one of the two. It must be Open Aperio that he's thinking about maybe that, but that's, that's um, you know. Un yeah, that's gonna be in new. June. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. It'd be great if he'd talk to me about some of these things, don't you think? <laughs> Surprise. Yeah. Oh, and Jen's asking when is open a period? I believe. Let me look at my calendar and make sure I have the right date. Um, it is June 14th and 15th. Open a period this year. Any other questions? Hey, Wilma, I asked in the yeah. chat, can we record the the demo today? Yeah, that's, we are recording. Question. Cool. Okay. Sorry. No problem. Um, I'll send out the link afterward so that people know where to find it. We usually put the archives up on the teaching and learning page in Confluence, but I'll, I'll send an email also once that's up. Um, okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Brian. Let me give you presenter. And um, you can show us all about hacks. All about hacks in one talk? I, I just couldn't. All right, let me share my screen. 
not by just talking. All right, let me do that thing that we were so accustomed to the last two years. Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 Sorry, I muted myself. Thank God. It's an awkward pause in the silence in between. So, um, thank you for having me. It's been quite a while. Um, we've been up to a lot in Hacks Land. Um, if you're not familiar with what Hacks is, so HacksTheWeb.org has a lot of information that needs better organized. So, uh, trying to consolidate everything into a few spaces. Um, Hacks is at the moment a series of over 338 web components. If you're not familiar with what web components are, um, we use a series of tooling um, based off of a, um, a group called OpenWC, uh, which uses LIT. So if you weren't here for acronyms, sorry, this is gonna be like acronym hell for a little bit at least. But what LIT does and what OpenWC does is it gives us a standard way to implement W3C spec web components. So LIT is an extremely small library um, that basically just allows for data reactivity between, in this example, uh, this dot name within a JavaScript class so that then when we implement our HTML tag, in this case called simple hyphen greeting and name world, it would print hello world. That's the basis uh, that underlies everything that we do. So everything we build is now web components based. Um, Hacks is a spinoff of Elm's Learning Network. If you've heard of that project before, which is originally why I got involved in the Perio, um, Hacks has kind of taken on a world of its own. So while we still use Elm's, I'll actually show some things uh, where Elm's is in use. Um, we use Elm's to power about 60 courses at Penn State. Um, I don't know, maybe roughly eight to 10,000 students a year touch Elm's architecture in some way uh, for online courses. So Hacks is this growing ecosystem of um, just these web components that start that do other things now. So Hacks is short for Headless Authoring Experience. It was a moonshot that I started pre-pandemic um, with the idea of if we have the ability as developers to define new HTML tags, whoops, I don't know what that just opened. If we have the ability to define new HTML tags, could we not bundle up and compose functionality in such a way that all of our systems are able to benefit from these tags? Because uh, they work across ecosystems. I could drop this simple greeting into Sakai or Xerti or any other ecosystem, and it's just going to work. Um, so because of evergreen browsers, adoption is probably in the nature of like 98% of web traffic. These will natively work, um, especially when you get into compiling. That aside, so what the hell is Hacks? So um, Hacks is, let's see what does I have here? Uh, not what I wanted to. Um, something. Okay, so this is a course running um, Hacks. Uh, one of the projects within the Hacks ecosystem is called Hacks CMS. So it's getting a little muddied. We're actually just gonna rebrand everything as Hacks um, because most people want the CMS appliance. <laughs> but so, there's no magic involved. What we're looking at here is thousands of web components orchestrated to build a content management system. And the unique aspect of this content management system is it's actually sitting on top of, in this case, Elms. So uh, I'll hit reload here in a second. I'll go to some other sites that demonstrate these, these headless bricks running elsewhere. But effectively, every web component on this page is not specific to the Elms ecosystem. So we made an intentional design decision about four years ago, drop all Elms-isms, all Drupal-isms, only build things that work for the native web platform. So for example, if we, in this case, we have a tag called site hyphen menu, any theme within the Hacks CMS ecosystem that I drop this into, I'll get a menu that automatically unfolds, has this same click behavior, ties into our routing. So you can see we get extremely fast page loads. Um, if you have any experience with Drupal, you would probably think I'm lying to say that these pages are being delivered by Drupal because of how ungodly slow that platform is. However, um, we're, I'd say when we switch to this approach, as far as Drupal serving up JSON data to power our, our sites, as opposed to actually 
um, delivering the entire system, it was at least a uh, 20 fold increase in performance. Um, so we pre pandemic, we were, this was like a, a fun experiment, like, oh, could we do these things and they'd be headless. Um, and so let me reload so you can see, All right? So we get a little loading screen thing and stuff starts to pop and it shows up. So this is easily a thousand web components orchestrated here. Everything, even down to like this breadcrumb is not Drupal delivered. It's the front end processing a single file and building everything on demand. Now, before someone asks, does this have issues with SEO or issues with accessibility? Those can be addressed. We have ways of dealing with, with both of them. SEO is becoming less and less of an issue and accessibility, um, modern accessibility tools and screen readers pick these things up just fine. Thank God IE 11 is dead. So anyway, what hacks is as far as editing would be, um, let me go to a play space because what I do is I always go, I'm in production and I'm going to show you a fun demo. And then I irre irrecoverably damage something in production. So I'm going to go to another implementation of hacks, not my production instance. So this is a um, software as a service implementation of hacks called uh, Haxium. And so any university member can come here. They automatically get a copy of Hacks CMS and they can just mess around and build up their own site. So um, I'm going to go to, it says clunky form. That sounds like it's fake material. All right. So I'm going to edit this content and this is primarily what people think of as hacks. It is a headless block editor. Um, so if you're familiar with Gutenberg, it's got some similarities to Gutenberg. Um, however, we try to learn from the mistakes of Gutenberg. So the idea is, um, there's lots of different ways to achieve content production through this editor. So what we're trying to go for is just a fluid, like if I want to write something that would appear as Markdown, it's going to process it as Markdown and interpret it and turn it into HTML. All right. So I can do basic content operations, but unlike Markdown based editors, if I want to throw a column in here, I can throw in a two column stack, take this paragraph, jump it over here, hit enter and add more content. So hacks is, uh, grown leaps and bounds usability wise through studies that we did, thank God, prior to the pandemic that we got done um, so that we could ingest that feedback and start to implement it um, in, in a time when we didn't have the ability to jump into user studies. So um, the other aspect of hacks is at any point in time, and I'll open this up, it's just, you know, those operations I did are just writing HTML. And so this is a, a low level philosophical stance on, on our core team's part um, that it has to be able to generate material that works in any other system. So there's no magic thing that only works with with Drupal here or um, in this case, there's none of these blocks that only work with hack CMS. These would work on just a vanilla uh, web page. So uh, if and so when I clicked, hey, make this two columns, it implemented a grid plate tag. So Hacks is able to talk to our web components via a schema we developed called Hacks, uh, Hacks Schema, go figure. And so any web component that emits this hack schema, when it gets selected in the page, Hacks goes, oh, this is how I'm supposed to build an editing interface for you. So we use a standard called JSON schema or an abstraction of it actually in order to achieve this. But so if I were to, let's close that and we opened up the detailed, oh, there's no edit mode for that one. Sorry, let me add some other block. <laughs> so we have other blocks basically. Uh, block here relates to web component and a web component. Then if I dropped in a little accent card, right? I'm selecting the grid layout and you see there's settings here. I could change this to a three column. I can disable the responsiveness so based on the screen real estate at hand, uh, so I'm going to disable responsiveness because personally, I always think of three columns that way, or I'm going to do two columns, one narrow, one wide. Um, then if I drop into the card in this case, right? So I've selected the accent card that I just placed on the page. It gives me the fields that are emitted from that accent card. So I can make visual changes to the accent card. I don't want a border on it. I would like it to be deep purple, which I don't think has any real implication for what I'm doing right now. Uh, background. Oh, there we go, background accent, okay. To make that work. Sorry, I haven't made one of these cards in a while. Um, 
So there's all kinds of settings that we can emit off of this item. I could, uh, I can't take a photo with my webcam right now, unfortunately, since I'm already streaming from it. But so let's grab this little hacks bird. And I apparently caused it an issue there. Sorry. So I'm going to hit save and I get my content saved. So this is the basic premise with hacks. I view source. I have my grid plate tag. It tweaked some attributes in the HTML. I added an accent card, which is an accent hyphen card tag. And all of these things trace back to um, something that's out on NPM. So I could go to accent hyphen card. And this is the asset that is in that page. So you could, in any application, just use any of the roughly 300 uh, assets that we've put together. Um, uh, these are becoming increasingly ridiculously easy to produce. Um, some of them are really complicated, but we have everything from video players to accent cards to, um, I usually use an example, Wikipedia query, just because it's really easy to follow the code up. But so all of our elements that are visual bricks that are available to hacks or to any website in this case, stem from being a web component. So if I go back to that site I was messing with, uh, there we go. Okay, so if I went to blocks and I typed in Wikipedia, Wikipedia article would show up and I could drag and drop a Wikipedia article onto the page. A Wikipedia article has unique settings in form presentation. I can choose to not show the title and we'll make this about a perio and hope that there's a Wikipedia article for a perio. Oh, it did not return an article that, so I'll return Drupal because I know that that has one. So not all articles come across. Unfortunately, the Wikipedia API is a little like finicky. It either gives you something or it goes like there was no exact result for that. But so um, if I wanted to embed the Wikipedia article for Drupal in Japanese, I've clicked two settings and I hit save, and now I have that. So that tag though is not required as part of hacks, right? So it's available. You could download just the Wikipedia tag from NPM and use it, or looking at the guts of it, it's just made up of CSS. It's got some initial default settings, taking into account the language of the document. So if you embedded that Wikipedia query tag into a page that defaulted to French or Japanese, it would just automatically select French or Japanese as the language in question. Um, so we can get into not just accessibility issues, but also um, internationalization. Uh, the content of what you see is actually using another web component. So another brilliant thing with web components is you can put them in other web components. So in this case, we have a citation element. When we wanna go get the content of that page, it actually goes and fetches against the Wikipedia API. And then the magic way it talks to hacks is this. Oh, no, that's app details, sorry is this, it says, hey, if any web component has a uh, method of hacks properties, either supplying JSON or returning a URL to go lo remote load JSON, in this case, it's saying, hey, go get uh, dot lib, there we go, hacks properties. So this is what hack schema looks like. It's pretty simplistic. Uh, we usually just copy and paste and modify for each new element that we make. Um, but so you can see here, this is why it says, that it's a Wikipedia article, it can be scaled and positioned, which tells the hacks editor what settings can show up. And then as far as settings in the page, when it builds out that form that said what the search term was, this was, oh, we'll change the property search when uh, applying a title that says article name and the method of input for the user is a text field. So just with this little bit of information, we can build an input field of you know, type text that then whenever I type it in, all it's doing is it's updating the search attribute on this element. And then when you see updates, that's because of the web components internal workings. So there's not, a, these things work with or without hacks by design. Um, and so as a result, we started to leverage them in other properties. Um, now, unfortunately they haven't gone any further with it. Uh, but for a time we were collaborating with the National Archives, they did a UX audit of hacks about two years ago. And one of the, you know, you scratch my back, we'll scratch yours type of things that came out of that was on this site, when you hit the Explore Our Websites, 
there's a NARA hyphen menu hyphen bar hyphen links tag, which is embedded in a simple modal tag. Simple modal is something that we developed, which is a highly accessible modal. It takes into account focus trapping, making sure there's focus automatically applied to the first element, all those things. And all you have to do is basically emit an event saying, hey, when this thing gets clicked, I need a modal that shows this material. And so this simple modal tag uh, improved in accessibility as a result of being on their properties. They're able to develop and ship functionality faster as a result of just leveraging a component that does it as if it's a new HTML tag, because it is. And, but at the same time, we can then reuse that in whatever properties we want. So um, this is a, a silly little code pen. I'll just start pasting it in the chat. And so we can see on this silly code pen, hey, there's a Wikipedia query that searches and shows you State College, Pennsylvania. Now, the reason it shows you an article about State College, Pennsylvania is because just prior to society um, eating itself, I um, got into the classroom. And so now I teach uh, one class called Emerging Technologies. Um, it's a 400 level course. And the beautiful thing about that course in the IST curriculum or information sciences is the instructor gets to make it whatever they want. So I teach web components. And the final project of every semester that that runs is to participate in the issue queue, building out and solving documentation, tooling, and building new web components. So last semester, we actually had uh, 11 teams of four, yeah, there were roughly four, um, work on various issues and requests that we've had from our community that are pedagogically centric issues as far as like, hey, I need a tag that just shows something interesting in this way, or um, one of them, I believe, was find the words. Um, so in little instructional activities, think like H5P and scope is, is what I had them uh, working on. And um, while that might not always work as far as like what their output is, last semester I had three solutions that I said like these, these are going to graduate. Like we could totally use these with some minor cleanup, um, one of which we've already adopted into our ecosystem. Um, it should be rolling out in the next month or so for our users as like a default tag. Um, it's a postcard. So you can basically make a postcard to set up a lesson. Um, why a postcard? We have a whole bunch of art history courses. You travel the world, you see different things. I don't have the time to dedicate to design an asset that is a web component that is a postcard. But if my students do, it's easy enough to wire up the hacks and then we get it in there and then we have a higher perception of quality of our online courses because, wow, look at all the effort and time they put into these, even down to the individual page level. So the reason that this currently says State College Pennsylvania is um, my course this semester is exploring uh, micro front ends. So I have students building mini back ends or connecting to APIs to visualize data. Uh, in the case of this, they were taking the Wikipedia query tag, learning about NPM, uh, how to install a modern front end project, and then uh, pulling the IP address of the user from one web service, using that to figure out their location in another, and then rendering it via Wikipedia uh, query tag. So I'm getting this fun, highly integrated, uh, like, I don't know, um, people at my university are actually like exploring the stuff we're doing. <laughs> Took a long time. It only took the world falling apart for people to realize what we were doing down the hall. Um, so here's another example of, of where Hacks is, has progressed. This is a static site generator version of Hacks called Hacks Levendy. Um, if you're familiar with Levendy.dev, it's a really popular static site building tool where you basically just put files in a, a correct directory tree, uh, run you know npm build, and it just out the or sorry, 11 build and out the other side, you get a website. So um, we've ratcheted hack CMS on top of that. And this is a, a project um, that our university libraries put on and send that so you can play with it. Um, so this is running hacks 11. So it's got all of our web component bricks, just like the other things do, except it's managed via static site files. And so in this case, graduate students are able to edit an XML format um, for rendering historical documents. In this case, uh, the Sea Voyage, which is like a play from the 1600s, I think. And so you can actually go and see, you can read the play, you can search in the text, but then you can actually go and pull up the images um, 
that are the original source material, right? So this is a book that's at the library. It's deteriorating because it's from the 1600s. And so they can scan, digitize, and get this for archival purposes and not have to think about how are we going to make a web page that you know, pre presents this information and preserves it because we have a web component for that. And so in this case, there's a TEI render tag. That's something that um, I worked with the university libraries to help them develop. So now there's a web component for rendering this historical document format called TEI. It's open source because everything we do is. And then it sits within, in this case, the theme layer of Hack CMS, which is clean too, which sits inside a tag that goes and figures out and builds the whole site. Um, so we're seeing um, currently, this is the only site that's using this at the libraries. However, it's loaded into um, a Docker uh, Kubernetes type of cluster um, because they're gonna have two more rollout this year. And I believe 44 more of these uh, such sites roll out over the next two or three years. Um, so it's more or less as they digitize these works, it's like the workflow thanks to Hack CMS and Hacks Levity is just there. So they basically put files in a folder and they get a site out the other side via CI CD process. So because of our investment in web components and building these things that are not really tied to anything, we just keep hitting hitting them over and over and over again and getting additional gains out of it, right? So whether it's, oh crap, it will be really useful. I'm on my phone uh, or I'm, I'm, I'm on the desktop. I want to take that QR code and go, I want to scan it in, right? We, at one time I had uh, lots of backend code that would generate QR codes for that little use case of like, hey, I want to continue where I left off and on my phone. Yes, there are other methods of send to your phone, right? Um, However, this is now just a web component that does QR codes. So we've had other requests for making QR codes for things. And now when I go to do project requirements for, um, in this case, we're rebuilding a, a studio environment soon. Um, if I wanna generate QR codes that directly link to student media that's produced, all I have to do is add a Q-R tag and give it a data source and it will generate this on the fly, no matter what it is. So it eliminated my need to ever think about how to solve that problem again, because this is a low level brick. It's as if HTML just naturally did this. And I never have to think about that problem again. And so the never have to think about that problem again for us becomes you know, icons, buttons, uh, routing back and forth between pages, menu systems that collapse, being able to change text settings automatically, and then remembering that setting when we reload the page, using the entire theme layer over and over again, making a print view of what we're doing. Whatever it is, we solve it with a web component, um, which I think is rather unique to our worldview. Like you, most of industry, I think you'll see, hey, web components are a neat way of augmenting my application stack. Um, they solve this one little problem. Maybe they have standardized menus or helps me with the scroller or something um, or breadcrumbs. We just get, we just keep going. We treat it like it's an, an onion and we're unpeeling the onion. You get out to bigger and bigger layers, basically. Um, so we start with the little tiny bricks and we just keep building out to the next layer. Sometimes we drill down. Sometimes we, we go um, at, to a larger concept. I don't need a picture of that little QR code. Um, so to see some other courses, um, that's another big, uh, big deal for us um, in spring. So this semester. We officially um, switched from our old design paradigm. So let me, let me just fire up a space. So if you saw that, that just load and it, it kind of like blinked and then a thing was there. Um, this is Drupal delivered. So Drupal rendered the page. It was talked to for the entire transaction. And then the output, we do push through web components. So we have some design consistency as far as, as usability. Uh, we were doing this with our courses up until this semester. Um, and so every course we deliver now is actually running Hack CMS and it's headlessly talking to Drupal. So if I hit tilde on my keyboard, there's actually Drupal behind the scenes, just like there was before. But we've basically hollowed out our, our theme layer so that any content that's produced is, is uh, rendered out through Hack CMS. So if I were to go and edit content in this, I promise I won't screw up this course too badly. Right, I would go and I'd say, well, we don't need quotes around the word study. 
And then when I hit save, it just reloads the page in place. And so it's an incredibly efficient user experience. We actually hadn't planned on rolling this out everywhere for spring. Um, last fall, we were going to dip our toe in the water of this of this approach. Again, I said this was an experiment prior to the pandemic. Um, if you could, you know, deliver a whole content management system with a robust enough experience to be able to power the system, um, and then our one um, our one candidate that we were going to use for delivering the theme was so overwhelmed by how much better this was than what we were doing that he wanted us to do it to all his courses. And then we started offering it, you know, kind of like word of mouth to other people. And we ended up with 10 courses that were in a pilot because people were just thrilled with it. So we basically skipped like another six month cycle of we were going to like roll everything over to this in the summer. Um, but it was so well received in the spring that we just we went for it. So this is um, we've got like 40 or so courses in arts and architecture. Um, at Penn State that use this now. Any new course that we're going to develop that goes through this system is either going to go through Elms or uh, hacks.psu. Um, if they're, and this, this causes a lot of confusion, honestly, even when like I try to communicate it, right? Because this is, they're using all the same pieces. So it's like we have to tease out what the other requirements are. Um, for example, we'll use Elms in this case if we have um, like a studio environment because we have another uh, application that's built out of web components. It's not purely headless. Um, it's for students to collaborate and submit media to each other. If we need to use that tool, then we're, we're talking about using Elms. Um, but sites that are in Elms, in this case, you know, this music course, really the only difference is injecting this top bar that has some of the Elms uh, navigation that our, our people need access to kind of different behind the scene pieces. Um, so other than that, and then, you know, so that that way there's a link to the studio in this case. But other than that, if I go to like, this is my course running on hacks.psu.edu, um, they look the same. They are increasingly having exact, you know, the exact same feature set. Um, sometimes we push things that are newer to hacks.psu.edu um, because it's a little more of an experiment ready, friendly audience versus our our bread and butter online portfolio that's in Elms. Um, that's, but again, like it gets weird because it's just, it's rendering hack CMS on top of Elms. So like to our end users, they don't know there's any difference. There's a different URL, um, which has been uh, like completely liberating for, for what we're doing. Um, we develop once um, and we basically know it's gonna work everywhere without even needing to tell I me, mean, we do tests at other places, but like it's gonna work everywhere as a result. Um, so I don't need to build that clunky form thing. Um, here's another, I want to show a different example. So this is, um, Everly College of Science. They also are now defaulting to hacks.psu uh, for all their faculty. So they were an original doctor of Elms with us internally. They had like, um, 20, 30 courses that were delivered via Elms. Now, um, most of those are still there, but they're starting to transition them to hacks.psu. Um, and so the main difference is um, mostly just Elms doesn't have the ability to, like in this case, they they created their own new web component that shows an overview of the high level of what the lessons are. Um, we didn't have those types of con uh, connotations when we originally built Elms. So them doing custom web component development makes more sense on hacks.psu. Uh, but a lot of times we'll then take those, the things that they pushed us on and then roll them back into capabilities of Elms or capabilities of the, the default settings for Hacks CMS. Um, so there's only two other things I wanted to show. This is a preview build of what we're rolling out um, shortly for the next release. So our next release has additional buttons on the side. And what we're trying to do is take uh, Hacks's live editing, right? Like I take this page in context, but maybe now there's, you can see the top says page details, and I want to change the title of this page to something else. And by saying change it to something else, it actually submits a web component to the back end that has the details of how to change the schema for the page itself. So in this case, I just updated the title of that page, uh, but we're trying to go for a much more app type of a vibe than a content management system. I don't know if you know this, but, um, uh, 
administration of learning management systems and content management systems is really boring. It's um, other than being on Zoom or a, a streaming video call, it's the last thing I want to do as a human being. Weird the way that works when you're constantly online. But if we can move to a more app driven vibe, what I mean by that is live updating, live reloading, live adding. This is adding pages to the system that I can then go and edit instantly. Um, shortcuts for things like if I want to inject a video player, having logic for getting a video player in there easily. If I already have what the link is, um, add a paragraph here below my video stuff, things. But if I just pasted a YouTube link to know intuitively, oh, you want to present a YouTube video. Um, we're getting into really low level, um, like, oh, well, if you select that text and you, you like having cross out because we need that as a button for some reason, I don't know why some people need that, or having the ability to do math jacks inline, turn things into vocabulary words, make this register as code. So if you're communicating about code, like I want to write that we're talking about the pre tag or whatever, that we could just do that in line. Um, we're getting really, really detail focused down to even, you know, stupid having an emoji con picker, um, uh, as well as um, full support for currently we have like minor support for my markdown, right? And that escalates it to a markdown in question, which makes it way easier, right? But then, you know, see, there's still some little hiccups as far as like, well, that didn't drop me out of a block quote. So we're trying to get really in the weeds with these little tiny uh, UX capabilities. Um, our component library is growing and we've been filtering and you know talking to our, our stakeholders, if you will, other faculty about like what elements make sense by default, and which ones are just you know fun to have. Like, cause obviously if I'm doing a demo, I have to drop a meme maker tag in into a page. Um, we've also had a lot of focus on things that our faculty don't care about, but really help with um, with adoption. Um, so we've had a big push on internationalization. Um, the hacks user interface can now be mostly translated into uh, into Spanish. Um, and I say mostly, like you know, it's still a work in progress. But some of the elements should even uh these ones don't unfortunately oh no oh, that does okay so like some of the different aspects of the ui will translate itself um the more important thing in my mind is we've created a methodology by which we can even do this um when you're getting really front end heavy it's it starts to get difficult at times um to be able to translate things on the fly and so we have a methodology for that so that we can start to bring people on uh, we have a pipeline of students and users that are both users of the system, consumers of the output, as well as builders of what the next the new innovations will be within our platform. Um, and so that's leading to uh, where Hacks is going next. So this is uh, Figma. Um, I'm currently working with a team of independent study students that uh, we're trying to get this rolled out for Hacks Camp. So uh, Hacks Camp. It was in the newsletter the other day, but and we're building our site out using Hacks Levity. So uh, Hacks Camp was just announced recently. It's being sponsored by IST, although I don't know what word they want me to use for sponsored. It's it's mostly hosted, right? So um, they're helping helping uh, fund students to work on uh, different aspects of this to make this event happen, so that it's a hybrid of like a networking event, but also a learning opportunity for students. So I've already got some commitments from some industry uh, partners, some people from Red Hat, some people from uh, a company in Ohio and one in Boston. I can't remember the, the names of those right now. I apologize. Um, and they're going to send people to come to our unconference. So um, if if you went to or are familiar with what happened at Duke, we had uh, in 2019, we had a Hacks Camp Duke. It was our very first one. And it's an unconference. And so everyone gets together, stands in a big circle, says who they are and what they're interested in learning. And more or less, the person that establishes the event uh, says, hey, we're here to have conversations about web components and things surrounding web components. And that's about it. Then it just it happens. So everyone builds the schedule, um, groups up based on what they want to learn. I'm planning on having um, I've invited a bunch of my students to come because this is right after the semester ends. Um, to come and present what they've been doing in class also to just learn more about front-end development and how to get more involved in projects 
So what my team is currently working on is reimagining um, the front door, if you will, to the hacks ecosystem, but also only talking about it like it's hacks. Uh, if you're a developer and you get down in the weeds to know that these things are all bricks you can reuse in other systems, that's great. But I'd rather a faculty member or a student engage with this system and have a really high quality user experience. And then, oh yeah, by the way, that other stuff matters to someone else. So um, we're working on a design paradigm that's more of um, more playful and fun and all the things that working with a content management system or learning management system are not. Uh, and so that when you go through this more or less multi-step form, at the end, you're going to have your website that you can start working with and click, and it's going to have this very app-like vibe to it. But the whole way through is just hacks. So this is going to be uh, running at hacks.pc80. We're hoping uh, to get this to be the new front door by May. Um, when I say front door, the current front door is um, is just this. Like So this is partially designed, mostly just functional. Right, so it has some cards that indicate what your sites are, this terrible table view, and I can add a new site named whatever, and it gives me a new site so I can start working. So we're trying to, uh, and this is currently what people are, are hit with. There's no training, there's no like, here's what you should do with, you know, to get started. And so we're trying to boil our universe down into, uh, are you working on a student portfolio? Cause that's gonna replace our studio product, or are you building a new online course? And so when they would select course, that they're given the or portfolio, they're given the type of portfolio or the type of course, whether it be a 15 week, six week, those type, you know, a training versus an actual course, uh, which could have implications, not so much for what's built in the end, um, but for what the starting point is. So our idea is that all of this, all these settings are basically just checking boxes as far as what the default should be to set up your hack CMS site. But your hack CMS site is still um, in the case of like this site that's here, it's still just static files. So like when someone goes to the Hacks Camp website and they would go to our roadmap, it is a statically generated file that has content in it. There it is. That has just the guts of the content in it um, for presentation, right? So at the end of the day, these are just things that could be zipped up and sent to someone else in more or less a forever format. I, I People criticize me when I say that web components are a forever format, but because they're such a low sta um, low level standard, uh, as long as you have the definition, it's always gonna work. So I would select a portfolio, that would then take me to the theme. And we're going for this very like, um, uh, Doodle Jump has been the inspiration for what we're building, like an 8-bit video game type of like playful, cartoony uh, paper. They actually have worked on some loading screens that have my silly hat is the loading bar. Um, and then you would actually see um, the assets loading. We would visualize the loading of the web components um, on the brim of my hat. You don't know it's my hat. Fortunately, it's just a weird 8-bit version of my hat. And then when it's ready, you just dump, are dumped into working on the site. Um, so we're working on what those, you know, what the return experience is like, um, whether you're selecting from things you've already had, what it looks like on mobile. Uh, we're, they're working on very customized sliders and things so that this looks and feels like a very cohesive, uh, intentionally 8-bit poorly designed, but highly usable uh, system. So we're gonna use uh, Wired.js as well as on the table, uh, which if you're not familiar with Wired.js, it's for like prototyping, uh, but we're actually gonna roll with that as, as what it is. So uh, there is Wired.js. So Wired.js uses JavaScript and an algorithm to manipulate SVGs so that you can get intentionally kind of rough looking things. And every time you relay the, reload the page, this will render slightly differently. Um, so we're going for this very much like, I'm in a notepad, I'm, I'm getting started with the project type of a mindset to then launch you into this really sophisticated tool that yes, it builds HTML in a format that you don't need to think about, but that's not what your focus is. You just need to build your stinking course or your your uh, your online portfolio. You know, build your career. So, um, other than to say, Hacks Camp is in person in May 9th and tenth. Um, you know, if you have, if anyone has any questions, uh, I'd say that was about all the links that I planned on running through out of the gate.
Wow, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, trying to digest it all. I, I'm sure um, folks will probably have questions. I don't know if there was anything in the chat. I think people were just kind of focused on your presentation. So if anybody has any questions while we have Brian here, it'd be a great uh, time to, to grab him. Free to turn on your microphone. Um, I have a question. Uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Brian. It was very interesting, but I'm not a technical person, so I didn't understand all of it. Um, but uh, one of the things uh, I we like to do is um, make a, a connection between the, the different communities and, for example, use make an example of using Hex in Zerti or in Sakai or whatever. Um, how easy, difficult is it for me to make an example using your web components? So um, the web, so the standard is extremely low level, which adds to the confusion. Like, honestly, when I, when we started looking into it, I was like, this is not a real thing. People can't mm -hmm. define their own HTML tags. <laughs> um, but so because it's such a low level, like imagine that you could redefine what the strong tag did in HTML. Um, it's at that type of a level. And so as a result, as long as what you're building is HTML based um, uh, it and it's running JavaScript, it can load these. Um, so the hacks editor basically just needs to have the dependencies um, imported. Um, that code pen actually has a, uh, we call that the magic script. And so the magic script um, automatically injects the, um, the definition of any tag that you put there. And okay. so if you had the H hyphen A hyphen X tag on even in that code pen and you put like a paragraph and some other, you know, HTML in between it, it would automatically, you'd see the edit button show up in the corner and you could hit edit and that would become a live editable thing. Yeah. So that um, sounds, that sounds <laughs> easy, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm going to try it. But um, if I have any questions, I, I come back to you. Yeah, please do. Um, I mean, it's it once you start to get in the we it's more of like a, a conceptual model bricking thing, right? Because mm -hmm. other stuff doesn't work. This it's not. And we've had a, an issue communicating that like, no, no, you like our button. We'll take it here. If you ran this command, you have our button. And that's just not usually the way these that our systems have worked historically, right? Like if I wanted an interactive example from Zerti, you'd say, well, you have to use all Zerti versus yeah. like saying, hey, this one, you know, the way you draw graphs is really cool. Can I have the code that does the graph drawing? And I'd get sent a repo and it would be some blob of JavaScript or whatever that's tied in highly with whatever your ecosystem is. And it's true of Sakai yeah. and everyone else yeah. um, versus this is like all these little fragmented things that we can reuse over and over again. And we, in fact, we beg, borrow, steal from other communities all the time for <laughs> our elements. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I can imagine it's not too difficult to use it in Zerti because on um, in a module, we have a special place where you can add uh, HTML or CSS, but also JavaScript. So um, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to try that and see if that works. And if it doesn't, um, I'm going to ask uh, what awesome. I have to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here, um, I'll send a... So I posted a, a link to webcomponents.pdu. So this has our um, our storybook, which is just the way that we kind of present. Like here's here's a nice little visual documentation of how our elements work. But on the very first page of it, it has something that says, "Hey, if you copy this and paste it into your application, all of our web components become available to you." Um, and we have them out on an Amazon uh, highly highly performant Amazon CDN. Uh, but basically anything that's in this second file, there's this JSON blob. Um, anything that is the tag name, if you add that tag name to your page, it will inject the definition via those two lines of JavaScript. So while that's not a, um, I wouldn't say that's the solution, like for rolling out a product, like in the end, it's a really um, provocative way to play around with. And like you said, if you can inject JavaScript or HTML or CSS, then you can add these things in and see like, 
what would this feel like? Because that's yeah. a lot of where we were at first is like, yeah, so our, I mean, our, we have plugins for uh, Grav, Drupal, WordPress, Backdrop, CMS, uh, Eleven D. But until you actually like see what the user experience is and go like, oh, that's what this does, it's kind of hard to know. Uh, oh. Looking through comments, unless you had, unless you had anything else. Sorry. <laughs> No, no, yeah, there's a couple other questions in the chat. Um, I think you answered one of them already about the kind of showcase. Um, but Sean was asking if you've had any experience hooking hacks up to non Drupal, non Elms um, LMSs or any other Perio projects. I have not done that, but I mean, that there's nothing in that script that would prevent it from working in other systems. Um, I actually wrote a, a bookmarklet that injects those scripts into Canvas. So then I could do demos internally to say, wow, wouldn't it be great if we were allowed to modify this vendor product that doesn't allow us to modify it at all? Oh, here, here's a thing. Um, uh, the, biggest, the biggest thing that would need changed for most systems, and it was gonna be an issue with Canvas anyway, like we had actually, I made that as a prototype to start a conversation. Um, but what the issue was always going to come down to anyway was, well, when you hit save, they have a really aggressive regex that just says, yeah, that's not an HTML tag and strips it out. And so if uh, Sakai or Xerti or any, any, any other Aperio product, when you hit save on whatever is generating an HTML blob of content, right, whether it's the user email or discussion forum post or whatever, when you hit save, if your regexes are sanitizing and stripping those out aggressively, then obviously they're not going to render. I and mean, it has to be able to store those tags. So there would have to probably be some work there to at least save. I, I can assume you'd want to filter those lists. I mean, I don't see anyone going and writing an H hyphen A hyphen X tag and injecting the hacks editor into the output, which basically would just screw up their user experience. It wouldn't achieve anything. Um, so no, I haven't done that directly, but, um, I mean, I wrote the six integrations or whatever that there are with other platforms, so it's totally doable. Yeah, I'd love to experiment with doing that in Sakai. Um, we probably have to whitelist um, some stuff for, you know, because Sakai does strip um, HTML and JavaScript that it doesn't like. So, um, but yeah, I, I think that'd be a really neat experiment. So definitely food for thought. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, all quiet. Adam is typing something. These are just thanks and great jobs. So mm -hmm. um, I think we've we've absorbed about as much as we can <laughs> for one go. But I really appreciate you coming and showing us um, what you guys have been up to lately. It's it's some exci exciting stuff. And uh, hopefully we can find some ways to incorporate it into, um, you know, Sakai and Zerte and some of the other Aperio projects um, to kind of be able to, to promote um, more than one thing at, at a time. So um, hopefully we can find some ways to do that. And um, again, I appreciate you attending our call. Feel free to drop in on some of the other ones. We do plan to have um, some demos from some of the other Aperio projects over the course of the next couple months. So hopefully um, some of you here today will join us for those. So um, it looks like we're almost at the end of the hour. So I'm not going to spend any time with Jira's. We didn't have any Jira's highlighted for today anyhow. So. Um, we can wrap up uh, about five minutes early and give you guys a little more time to get to your next meeting if you have one at 11. <laughs> so um, thank you, everyone. And again, this this uh, demo was recorded and will be available on the Aperio uh, YouTube channel. I'll send out the link around once I get it loaded up there. All right. Well, have a great day, everyone. And thank you again for attending. Thanks for having me.